God bless you, my brother. Thank you very much. We may sit down. I, I did the story of Rahab deliberately. In my reading of the Bible, no single story illustrates the grace of God to me than the story of Rahab. And I've also shared it because every time I reflect on that, it speaks to me. And I want, I want to ask myself, Lord, do I have such grace? Now, when you look at grace, and I want us to reflect on that this afternoon about the grace of God. I might refer you to Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. Jesus introduces us to grace that is available to every human being under the sun. And in Matthew 5, 45, Jesus opens to us all the heart of God so that we may see the heart of God. And reminds us that uh, your Father is in heaven. He makes the sun to shine or to rise upon the evil and on the wicked. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. The sun shines upon every human being. Wicked and righteous, just and unjust. And this is Jesus. Remember he said, I have come to show you who the Father is. This tells us there's a common grace that is available to every human being under the sun. There are prayer meetings I used to be part of, but I no longer participate in them because I think I'm maturing. When you organize prayers to curse people who don't believe the way we believe, don't live the way we live, the religion is different from our religion. When you're going to prayer meetings, praying and cursing and ordering some of the religious worship houses to come down, then I begin to realize that's not the heart of God. I was in a prayer meeting sometime last week, organized by brethren with enough scriptures. And they are brethren who belong to a particular political persuasion. And the meeting was organized to curse the enemy. The enemy here means brethren from the other political persuasion. And, and I sat through the meeting and brethren reading scriptures, God, by June, in the name of Jesus, so and so and so and so should be dead. As I continue to understand God, there are prayers I don't make. God loves people. You see, if Rahab was a prostitute, if there were prostitutes in Jericho, Rahab was chief prostitute. And I'm reminded the words of Paul that Timothy, my son, this is a true saying that Christ Jesus came to save sinners and I'm the chief sinner. 
I do think if the Apostle Paul was alive today, I think he was worse than Al Shabab. What Paul did, even Al Shabab has not done. And if the grace of God came to Paul, if the grace of God came to Rahab, and he says, Christ Jesus came to save sinners, and I'm the worst of them. There's a common grace. Every human being under the sun. I thank God. Our theology falls right on the face when we think the non-Christians in the organizations we work with should not be promoted. We should be promoted that they should be brought down. We don't know God. We don't understand him. God loves people. Whether they are Christians or non-Christians, whether they are saved or not saved, God loves people. They are made in his image. I don't pray those prayers like turn to send a maid thunder. While at the university, firebrand preacher, I preached in a local church. Blessed people got so filled with the Holy Spirit. It's time you're preaching to people. Just love them. And I preached. Presented me. What you told them I am is the Lord may help me never to misrepresent him. Like, I don't care whether you go to heaven or hell. I don't care. God reminded me, I care. That's why I sent Jesus. And I've sent you because I care. God loves people. God loves our enemies. And God has a common grace available to all of them. In Luke chapter 2, verse 40, it talks about Jesus. And the child grew and waxed strong in the spirit. He, was, he, had, fist, he, had, he had filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Growing in grace. The child grew. We come into the kingdom as children. But we need to grow. There's a, a saying in town that to be born is a must. Growth is by choice. All of us were born. You didn't choose to be born. But I have to choose to grow. I met a fellow we used to preach with in the 90s, early 90s. And I noticed he's still preaching what we used to preach in the 90s, actually using the same notes. And when he heard me preach, he thought I had backslidden. I didn't correct him. I have not backslidden. I'm just growing. And the things I used to do, no more. When I was a child, I thought like a child, and I preached like a child, and there's nothing, you know. You can only minister to the level of growth 
God has enabled you. So, I meet people who think I know how to teach. So, so many people tell me, Brother Elisha, write a book. I said, I'll write a book. But please don't quote me. There are things I knew last year at that level. But God has taken me to the next layer of revelation. That other layer is not wrong. It was only for that level. But I understand it at a higher level. So if I wrote a book last year, it would be at that level. And it would be obsolete by now. That's why professors never write books. Because by the time he wants to write a book on point A, he has already moved to the next level of knowledge. Let me explain that to you. When I was in class one, up to three, up to seven, my good teachers insisted that the earth is round. How many went through that? And to date, if you do KCPE, the answer is still the same. The earth is round. I went to Form 1, and the geography teacher came and said, open this page. The earth is oval or spherical. So when you do Form 4, the earth is not round. It's oval. So I went to a level from five and six and uh, Mr. Fred Akello teaching us geography. He told us the earth is not round, it's not oval, it's goid, it's G-O-I-D, it's shaped like a human fist. Now all those things are true depending on your level of education. So those days, Bishop Katembu of you demon, before you come out, can you say your name? <laughs> How many were there? <laughs> Don't just go out. Say your name, far, <laughs> And tell us where you came from and who say? And they said their names, didn't they? And they say, who sent them? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but it was not wrong. It was just a level. And for those who are in the Emmanuel Anything, and Rebecca Brown, and Elaine, devil worshipping, you know how to do deliverance. You make the person sit in a chair, and they face the door. And you open the windows so that when the demons come out, there's no obstruction. How many of you remember that? <laughs> yes. And uh, you had a series of scriptures to read to the devil. And then the ladies, the ladies would sing, there is power, wonder working, power in the blood, in the blood. And how many of you remember how you make the devil to drink the blood? Drink the blood now. They were not wrong. That was the level of understanding. And in the days of ignorance, God worked through that system. And people actually got delivered. How many of you remember the days when every service had troughs for vomiting? Because when the demons came out, they came out in the vomit. So when the deliverance session is here, they're spitting and a lot of vomit. Never wrong. The, the revelation comes layer upon layer. Layer. And one needs to grow. So the child grew. Tell your neighbor the child grew. 
but he grew physically. And he became strong in the spirit. Not just strong, but strong in the spirit. My young days of setting people free from Satanism. I know you guys don't remember that, but the wrestling in the deliverance room. Anybody went through that? These guys who are demon possessed who are wrestling with people. And you have one small little girl and all the brothers with all the ugali cannot hold her down. And say, ah, come on! Oh, oh, in Jesus' name! And there's a lot of that. And you have to go through that also. Then as you grow slowly, God begins to tell you, you know what? It's not by power. It's not by shouting. It's not even by the scriptures you read. It's by the holy. Then you read where it is written that the yoke shall be broken by the anointing. I know there are people here who drank anointing oil. There was no crime. In Kisumu years ago, it's a popular Nigerian preacher. I will not give you the name. It could be a relative. Met him at the supermarket with a very noisy, with, with a very senior brother to me, brother Njuru. Njuru, I didn't know Njuru is such a strong guy. And he, we met the guy in the supermarket. He was holding a big meeting in Kisumu. Njuru said, excuse me, praise the Lord, man of God. I said, amen. My name is Njuru and I'm born again. I'm attending your meeting. He said, oh, welcome. Then he said, I have a question for you. Is it true you guys drink anointing oil? And the man said, yes, we, we do drink anointing oil. Why? And he said, the Bible says if somebody is sick, you anoint them. Now, in case the sickness is inside your stomach, for the oil to touch your stomach, you drink it. I thought, I thought it makes sense. I mean, I thought, really, it, it really makes sense. <laughs> you have stomach ulcers and I want to touch there with oil. He became strong where? In the spirit. And strength in the spirit comes when you feed your spirit. And you and I know the many hours Jesus took alone in prayer. He went to the mountains, he went to the bushes. But Jesus took a lot of time with his heavenly father. I don't want to be mean. I've used so many devotional materials. I've used New Day, Every Day with Jesus. I've used Daily Bread. But I have a friend who gave me one last month. It's called Face to Face with Jesus Every Day. It's online. It's amazing. It's changed my time alone with God. Totally. I've never gone through what I'm going through now in my devotion. But the child grew strong in the spirit. Now, I want just to correct you. I was taught that reading your Bible and praying makes you strong spiritually. That, that's also true. But I now know you can read your Bible and pray every day and yet not have time with Jesus. The focus of my devotion is not the scripture. It's not prayer. When I get to my devotion, I want to have time with my Jesus. The scriptures are a means to take me to Jesus. The scriptures reveal Christ. Prayer is a vehicle to connect me. So the most important thing is 
connecting with Jesus every day. I'm sure you know people who have gone to those prayer mountains. They went for 40 days. And when they came back, the only change that has taken place in their lives is that they went for 40 days. Otherwise, they're the same. Because you can go for 40 days and never meet Jesus. And I would not waste my time. Elijah was a guy of prayer. And one time he went to the mountain for about 40 days. A strong wind came, he never moved. The lightning, he never moved. Things moved, he never moved. Because he didn't go for lightning. He didn't go for the earthquake. He didn't go for the wind. He didn't go for the fire. Unfortunately, most of us here, myself included, if I go to the prayer mountain and in the cave where I'm praying, fire comes down. I just pack my bags and I come back and say, Pastor, fire came down. Down. All these things happened. Elijah did not go for the fire. He had gone to have an encounter with Jehovah. And he said, after all those things had passed, then the Lord came to Elijah. It's not the activities. It is the person. So he grew in spirit. And he was filled with divine wisdom. Divine revelation. And the grace of God was upon him. What growth. What a pregnant chapter and verse. What a summary of a complete man. Jesus, our model. The grace of God. The writer says the grace of God was so much upon Jesus, it was almost visible. We have loose translations. And people say the grace of God means God's unmerited favor. I don't think that's, if you say, and God's merit, <laughs> And God's unmerited favor was upon him. The grace here refers to the divine presence. Sometimes the word grace means divine enablement. Or divine help. That's why Paul says, oh, I have done more work than all the other apostles put together. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was at work in my life. Now, just carry this with you. That God's grace was upon Jesus. Have we ever read the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14? And the Word was made flesh, and the Word dwelt among us or lived among us uh, and we looked at his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the father and he was full of grace and truth not truth and grace but grace and truth
Jesus spoke truth, but grace arrived first, then he spoke the truth. I know some of us, especially me, we are honest, we are blunt. Speak the truth. Nothing else but the truth. No compromise. Anybody young enough here to have read the book I Loved a Girl? Anyone? By Walter Trobisch? Thank you. And the other one following called I Married You. Thank you. There is a story in one of those books. I don't know which one. Oh, Pastor Walter speaking in a West African country. And he was speaking to young people beyond adolescent, young adults. And that night, he was speaking about sexual purity and sexual impurity. And that night he chose to speak on part one, which is adultery, fornication. And he described a woman or a girl who is not a virgin. From the Song of Solomon or I think from Proverbs. Either of them. I don't remember the exact quotation, but some people are saying that if our sister was a gate, we would do whatever. So he said, if you are here, you're a lady, it's possible you're a gate. Everyone walks in and walks out. And the red Isaiah that says, for my tent is torn. And there's no one to put it up for me. And it took two hours reading from those scriptures. And he said, tomorrow I'll talk about purity. It was a night meeting. People went to bed. Thank God, Brother Walter was a man alive to the Holy Spirit. At 3 a.m., the Holy Spirit woke him up. And he woke up and he had been allocated a driver who slept in the next room. And he told the driver, wake up, get into the car. He was in a strange country. But he didn't know where he was going. He told the gentleman, just drive. Where? Just drive. I don't know where we are going. That's how difficult it is sometimes to walk with a man or a woman led of the Holy Spirit and you are his driver. So it's just keep driving. And they just drove. And they came to the Pastor Walter saw the shape of a human being on top of the bridge, just about to throw himself or herself into the dam. He told the driver, when you get to that place, slow down. And the driver slowed down, and Pastor Walter ran out climbed up and got hold of the legs of that woman and she was hanging over the bridge and he held her and she said let me die and he said you are too late Jesus has already died for you and the woman said let me die tent is, my tent is torn up who are you? he said my name is Miriam I was in your meeting. You talk, Walter says, if the Holy Spirit would not have helped me, not the woman, tonight somebody was going to die because of a sermon that I preached. And he wondered how many people have committed suicide because of his ministry. Because he spoke the truth. He spoke the truth. There was no lie. She had accepted. She was a gate. The Bible says in John, Jesus is full of grace and truth. 
that grace ought to come first. One day Jesus was demonstrating this for us. A rich, young ruler came to him. You remember the story? And he said, what shall I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Oh, keep the commandments. I have kept them from my youth. Then Jesus, no, <laughs> the Bible says these words. And of late I'm reading my Bible slowly. The Bible says, when he said, I've kept all the commandments, the Bible says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And then Jesus spoke to him lovingly. Because what Jesus was telling him was a hard thing. But he loved him far. Full of grace. That means, may I never say some truth to someone without enough deposit of grace in my heart. Grace and truth. I have a non-Christian old man, friend of mine, he comes to my home every Monday, we take tea. He's illiterate. One time he told me, Pastor, I don't like truth. Truth is not good. <laughs> How many of you can agree with him? <laughs> I know, I know. You know, you guys, <laughs> you think truth is good? Truth is only good when it is being served on your neighbor. <laughs> Let me ask again. How many of you will not be comfortable if anybody told you the truth about yourself and you say I want to be comfortable how many will not be comfortable let me see by a show of hands you see how many are saying pastor me I'm okay let them tell me everything okay how many are saying I'm in the middle The guy told me, Pastor, I don't like truth. Especially the naked truth. And he told me, truth should be dressed up nicely. <laughs> Any married person here ever tried to tell your wife that the dress is short? And he said, excuse me, that dress is a bit short. What was the reaction? <laughs> That's the line you don't go. You have to dress it up. How many of you couples realize that it can take you two years before you tell your spouse something? Huh? You're still looking for words and a good opportunity. I said, tomorrow I'm telling him or her, but when you wake up, you study the weather. Read the weather forecast. Say, <laughs> Mungu wacha nivumilie. Okay. In the Bible, we have a story of uh, a man who said the truth. His name is called Ham. His father was naked. And he told people the truth. The naked truth. Did he lie? No, it was truth. His brothers covered the nakedness of that truth. When the father woke up, he did not cast harm. Read your Bible. He cast the son of Ham. He said, cast be Canaan. Later on, he gave Israel the land of Canaan. And Canaanites 
are not there in the face of the earth to date. I don't know why he never cast the sun. Titus and Queen, they have gone to Israel. They must be knowing. He will tell us why when he comes to close the meeting. He knows everything. Uh, my conjecture, my, my imagination is that I know some guys who have a bad temper. If he loses his temper, he will not beat you. He will go and beat the table first. So I, I am thinking this guy, he said, Na hii hasira yote ni kimuwa kwa kuyu mtoto, wacha niende kwa grandchildren. But grace and truth, grace and truth. Verse 16, and of his fullness have we all received grace for grace. We have received the fullness of Christ. Grace for grace. It's all grace. A friend of Victory Fellowship in the old days called Reverend Dano Diambo, he's gone to be with the Lord. I heard him say one time that almost all the letters of Paul begin with grace and end with grace. And he said that Paul starts with grace, ends with grace, then he sandwiches himself between the grace. I like that word, sandwich. And I pray that may our lives be sandwiched in grace. He's still talking of grace in verse 17. The law was given by Moses. That again, read it together with me. But grace and you see the consistency. It's not truth and grace, but grace and truth came by Jesus. We live with our families in a lot of sharia and laws and expectations. As parents and as husbands and wives, we get very legalistic. The problem starts in the premarital counseling when the counselor tells us these are the duties of Titus, these are the duties of Queen. And you make a list of your duties, my duties. We do the same with our finances and we take the thing to the children. I was visiting a church and preaching in Scandinavian country. An elder and an older man took me for lunch. We shared lunch together and then I would not see him again, so he said, my brother, I want to pray for you. And he prayed for me in the Holy Spirit. When he was done praying, he spoke to me a word that I want to speak to you. He said, my brother, may your family never deserve your love. May they never qualify for it. Live with them by grace. You know, grace is when you get what you don't qualify for. You see, we've been brought up to reward good behavior and punish bad behavior. And we carry it to our family. That was 2015. 
that keeps ringing in my heart. I said, Lord, could I be trying to make my children qualify for my love? Are they trying to please me to get things out of me? What about my wife? And I tell God, help me. They should never qualify for it. They are my flesh. They are my blood. God, you have loved me unconditionally. I want to love them when they qualify and when they don't qualify. Let me tell you something about me and finances. There are times I've made a mess of myself financially. And I've gotten myself into financial difficulties because of my own stupidity. When I get to that place where I know I brought myself there deliberately, I walked into that financial mess. Then the devil tells me, you know, because you got here by yourself, God is not going to take you out of it. So I don't tell God. But when it is getting out of hand, where could I go but to the Lord? So I go, I said, Daddy, um, uh, it's me again. <laughs> I've, I've blown it again. And I say, I, I didn't tithe. I did things I shouldn't have done with money. I'm sorry. Please, Dad, get me out of this hole. Without fail, he has always gotten me out of that hole. But guess what? I find myself again in that hole. Where do I go? Back to him. And he has never told me that the other time you got into the hole, I got you out. This time, sort yourself out. He's never said that. That he has been good. He has gotten me out of those holes a thousand times because he, my daddy, he keeps no record of wrongs. He forgives and he forgets. Psalm 103, he remembers we are flesh. Until recently, I told him, Dad, on this matter of money, uh, please, I, I just have a problem. You'll have to bear with me. I'm still your child. And he understood, and we are okay. And so God has forgiven me so many messes that I really am trusting God to allow my children to mess up. Because I'm also a mess. I stand here not because I'm good, but because of the grace of God. And I need to extend the grace to anybody near me. That man said to me, may they never deserve your love. One of the children that I'm supporting went to school and didn't do well. She was an A student and ended up with D. And I wanted to call her and give her peace of my mind. Spent money, took her to a national school. And all you bring back here is a D. So I called her. She was on the way to treat you with grace. And he said, extend the grace to her. The poor girl came trembling. She knew I needed the result. And she stood there and I said, sit down. I said, tell your guardian to give you permission this evening. I'm so proud of you. 
You're such a wonderful girl. Don't worry about your performance. God has a better plan for you. Tell your guardian, I'm taking you to Kisi, to the best hotel we are going to celebrate your performance. And tomorrow, I want you to have a flight to Nairobi. And when you land at the airport, I'm sending a guy who will take you by car. You'll spend your night in State House. Then the next day, they'll put you on a shuttle. You come back. Don't worry about that grade. You are better than that grade. And I told her, I love you. I will support you. It doesn't matter what you score. And Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is higher than all my sin. Beloved of God, my sin was great, but his grace was greater. I one time listened and I was, there's a lady, she was saying a lot of things, but she shared her life of alcoholism and drug addiction and marital unfaithfulness. And she was the wife of a pastor. And then she stopped and she said, I want to thank God who looked beyond my faults to see my need. That's grace. When he looks beyond our faults to see our need. Beyond Rahab's prostitution was a deep need of a savior. Grace came by Christ Jesus. And you and I, we have received Christ. And what we can give to the world is nothing but the grace of God. There's a gospel Jesus told us to preach, and I do not know whether we are preaching it. Have you ever read the Bible? The Bible says, Jesus sent some guys and says, you go out there to those terrible sinners, and when you meet them and they assemble in your crusade, Jesus said, tell them that their sins have been forgiven. How many remember that was? That when you go to the non-believer, tell them their sins have been forgiven. They can walk in and receive salvation. Now, look at the early church in Acts 4.33. The apostles gave witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ with great power or anointing. The apostles. And great grace was a on all the believers. I talked of common grace. There is another grace called great grace. Other people call it the apostolic grace. Some of you in the Wallace, you could be knowing somebody called the Nakran. Don't know about him, I just heard about him. I was watching one of his messages. How there was a city where some brothers were trying to preach and the demons were caning them physically. And so the church could not penetrate. So one time these brothers were fasting and the demons confronted them. 
And these Indian brothers prayed, and then the, one of the demons said, we will not go out of this city. But if you call the Nakran, we shall go. So, there is a higher level. There's a great grace that operates in the lives of certain people. Of course, the Nakran went there. By the time he landed, the demons are taken off. And people are getting saved left, right, and center. I'm sure you have come across people that while you're in the you are in their presence in a mission. There is some manifestation in the spiritual arena which you can only describe as great grace. And when you're with them, things just happen. And that happens to leadership. Hmm. You guys don't ever think that you have just built this church because you are well organized and you have more money and you drive some second-hand vehicles. No. <laughs> no. There are churches bigger than you, with a better parking lot than yours, and their buildings are stuck at the foundation for the last 15 years. It is grace. And that grace sometimes dwells in the leadership. A leader might not be eloquent. A leader might not be as organized as you and I are, but there's great grace. So let me take you deeper. May I? Without naming names. Have you seen an organization with a great apostolic leader and you find under that leadership very powerful and strong people start to emerge with very tremendous anointing. And this leader steps back and allows these guys to shine. And the devil begins to tell these younger people, you are under oppression. A good talker, start yours. And then you see these individuals going to start their own things in rebellion, and the fire fizzles out. You've seen that? Because they didn't realize they were operating under grace upon that man. And the moment they go start theirs, that grace is not available. So this great grace was available under an apostolic thing. Great grace. You're sure you've read chapter 11? of Acts. Philip, the evangelist, is down in Samaria. And men, guys are born again. So we, we read chapter 10 and then when the church is growing up, they send for our brother Peter. So Petro comes down to the place and he finds the brethren. Verse 23. Uh, when he came among the brothers, he saw the grace of God on the people. Now, this is amazing that someone would come to your fellowship and see the grace experience the grace and they leave the church hey my god there was so much grace there the church is not an organization the church is a living organism you may have a well organized thoroughly administrated well-oiled German machine type of a church. So efficient like a German system. And yet, 
There's no life. There's no grace there. All there is is organization and order. The church is a living organism. What brings us together is not the organizational skills. It is the life we share. The life of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just congratulate you. I came here and uh, the short time I've, I've been experiencing the grace of God among you. You guys are not working. You are living. I, I, I've been to churches, including mine, where things work because of the sheer organizational skill and the streamlined things. Things work according to plan, which is okay. And when you go to such churches, you'll find order, excellence, very gloomy faces and stressed workers. I was surprised you guys can laugh. In many churches, there's no laughter, there's no joy, because nikazi. But when this man of God came down, he saw what? The grace of God. You know, the grace of God is where the ladies serving the meals don't do it because they're on duty. But the grace of God is just upon their lives. It's not my department. I just like doing it. That's the grace of God. And when a new person comes among us, he will taste and experience that grace. When the apostle went down, he saw the grace of God. I was in a church in a European country and I just walked in. They normally start their service with a cup of tea. When tea is ready by eight in the lobby. They have a lobby out there and they actually lock the door. The service starts at eight and it starts with tea at the lobby. Only the worship team are here. And, and I found men, women, children, there's no section for kids. There's no section for adults. People taking tea, walking around. And I was mingling with them, but the, the, the fellowship, the, the communion, the koinonia. Hmm? I mean, uh, I felt it so much that I actually went to the washroom and I cried because I said, God, what is this? This is the book of Acts, God. And I remember one little boy going up to the senior pastor, say hi to Um, Me and my friends, he's nine years old. See, me and my friends, we were praying and fasting, and the Lord told us this. And uh, you can tell the church. I'm looking at the guy. Again, I went to the toilet to cry. I said, God, this is... <laughs> What's this now, Lord? I used to know this thing. This is... This is something, this is how it ought to be. When he came down, he saw what? Let's go there. He saw, the, he had seen the grace of God. He was glad. And he told them all, you guys cling to the Lord with one purpose of heart. I have eight minutes to go. Chapter 13 of verse 43 of Acts. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas. Who, Paul and Barnabas, spoke to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Continue in the grace of God. How key is it to continue and to grow in the grace of God? Do you know the grace is what sustains you and me? Nineteen eighty seven there was a major earthquake in the Pentecostal 
community. A servant of God called Jim Baker came down. He was a leading television evangelist in America. He came down under a huge scandal. It was a, a church quick. Two months later, the next leading televangelist, Jimmy Swaggart, also came down crashing again. That year, 87, Dr. Maurice Cerullo was here. He was interviewed by the late Casavulli. One of the questions they asked him on KBC, Jimmy Baker is down, Jimmy Swagat is down. They have been pretending they are servants of God. See, your comment, Mr. Cerullo, how can I forget what he said? He said, Catherine, and tears began to roll his eyes. He said, when I see men of God stronger than me, better than me, coming down, I cling to the cross and I say, Lord, I'm weaker than my friends. Hold me in your grace alone. Without your grace, I'm gone. Continue in the grace. Another time, CNN interviewed our friend Billy Graham. And you know those guys thought Billy Graham knows everything in the Bible. So this guy used to have suspenders. He's called who? CNN, uh, that guy, veteran journalist. Larry King. And Larry King, when he's interviewing you, he will read. So Larry King read the book of Daniel, that image with silver and gold, all the stones, big guy, and the feet of clay. Then he said, Dr. Billy Graham, can you interpret what are these kingdoms? What is brass? What is gold? You know, what's clay? Billy looked up and said, Larry, when I look at that image, I only understand that it doesn't matter how great you are, how much gold you have, how much silver you have, and how popular you are, but every human being has feet of clay. And I'll carry that with me the rest of my life. As I stand before you, I have feet of clay. The rest might be gold and silver, but my feet are clay. Without the grace of God, I'm finished. I have no power, no strength on my own to stand. I can only lean on his grace. And that is found in Acts chapter 14. I will read verse 3. They took a long time, therefore, leaving them and speaking boldly in the Lord. And the Lord gave testimony to the word of his grace. There is this phrase, the word of his grace. Prayed with the Ephesian elders. The Bible says, Brethren, yes, I don't know whether they got it, but we'll come there. Another time, the apostles were commissioning guys to go and teach where they had been, they were being released to the grace of God. coming through the hands of great men like Derek Prince, Dr. Maurice Cerullo, Bill Subrisky. I come to you as a demon chaser. I come to you as a man who, over the years, had confidence in my own prayer, and I knew my prayer could sustain me. But today I'm wondering whether, even as I pray, 
is possible to cover every area of your life. If God was to depend on our prayer to sustain us, really. <laughs> and so, I come to share with you that as they were being released, they were commended to the, to the grace of God. Chapter 15, verse 40, it repeats the exact phrase of Acts. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren and to the grace of God. Whenever the brethren were going on a mission or a ministry, they say, brothers, we commend you to the grace of God. I was a university student. I shared a room with a servant of God. I was going to preach at a Gorosari High School, walking distance. This guy was a veteran. And I stood up, I picked my Bible, he said, Oh, Kijana, unaenda kubiri, eh? may I pray for you? When somebody prays two lines, can you forget? Especially if you're a prayer warrior. He laid hands on me and said, May God's right hand be on you and the grace carry you. And it was done. As I stood in front of those students, I'm sorry, I could literally feel God's hand on my shoulder. Very heavy. And from that time over the years, as I go to minister, I've learned to tell God, let your hand be on me. And let your grace carry me. You know, Paul one time said, we don't put confidence in the flesh. Beloved of God, let me shock you. I no longer even put confidence in my own preparation, but I prepare. But the horse is prepared for the battle, but the victory belongs to the Lord. At the end of the day, it's not my preparation. It boils down to the Lord. Brother Washira, you remember when we hosted our good friend and hero, Titus Masika in Mo University. And the man preached. <laughs> I, want to, I want to meet him and remind him. He preached so powerfully. And then he said, the sick will be healed and blah, blah, blah. But when he began praying, nothing moved. But Masika is Masika. He turned to God. He said, God, if you don't move, I will move. <laughs> and uh, heavens opened <laughs> immediately. I think uh, sometimes I don't know whether God is responding to threats or out of sympathy with his servant. I don't know which. <laughs> uh, I was an usher in that meeting. God moved for years and years. The question I'm still holding for Titus when I get a goat to visit him is to ask him, sir, in case God didn't move that day, how are you intending to move? <laughs> <laughs> Just heal all the sick and let the cripple walk in. <laughs> when I was young, I even knew how God would move. But today I don't know. His ways are not my ways. They were released to the grace of God. Amazing. How sweet. Rare. Now, when you come to Acts chapter 20, there is a definition. Verse 
verse 24. Paul is being told not to go to Jerusalem. He's saying, I'm going. They say, you're going to die. He said, I'm okay. He said, in every city I've been to, they're saying persecution, prison are waiting for me. Verse 24. None of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and finish the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. What is the ministry? To testify the gospel of the grace of God. There's only one gospel. The gospel of the grace of God. How God so loved the world is a gospel of the grace of God. And sometimes I ask myself, how many gospels are going on in the whole world? No wonder people are not being born again. Preach the gospel of the grace of God without anyone come to rest. He never fails. And that made it my duty to be so careful in my life when I had an opportunity to share God's word. Now, so then, yes, right now. Now, can we stop? Can we listen about the moments? Can I say something confusing? I, I, I'm here to mess up. Bishop Katengo with Katengo and Ragan is written, okay? I was in the mess of the book here. In my earlier ministry, I prided myself as a Bible teacher. But as I'm growing younger in the Lord, I can't find any place where I was told to teach the Bible. This is not given to me to teach the Bible. A Bible teacher teaches the Bible. But I'm called to preach the gospel of grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. I know where that look records three times. He said, and when we came to Ephesus, Paul declared Christ. And Paul says, you pray this make him upon you. I knew Galatians. I knew nothing but Christ. And we are called to preach the gospel, not the gospel and the Bible and the same. I'm talking to learned people. That's why it's English. There's a big difference between the Bible and the gospel. So when Peter comes to the house of this man called uh, huh? the Gentile, the first Gentile, and I don't know, Cornelius, Cornelius says, Me and you came and told to call you so that you can tell me something. Peter says, Oh, Cornelius, the gospel is only what? The gospel is only how this. Or how God anointed Jesus Christ. So the gospel is Jesus. And the only thing we are called to answer to the world is the gospel of grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And why may I feel the church is lost? One of my mentors, the apostle, he said, Brother Elijah, I look at your sermons. I'm not a sermon manufacturing machine. I preach right. From where I come from, my AD background, I don't have sermons only. You are sermon, I go to reach native, they tell me you are less than eight minutes doing a sermon. So in my old church, you have sermons and some words. I want to testify the grace of the gospel of grace of God.
strength that is to arouse the night of men you should call, and the truth of God with grace. Hmm. Which is able to heal you up. Grace is able to heal you up, to give you an inheritance among all those who call them sanctified. So, grace sanctifies. I want to close in 10 minutes days late for that. Very quickly, you come to Ephesians 2. We are saved by grace. So that you have what we call the saving grace. The saving grace. That's the grace that brought you right. We are saved by grace. And like the Galatians are told, if you are saved by grace, you have to continue in grace. If you come back to legalism, the beast, the foundation of grace, the buildings of grace, come your red arena. Bible says that when Zerubbabel laid the foundation, he will finish when he is raising the roof with putting grace, grace, grace. Our lives ought to be grace from A to Z. It is grace that brought my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieve. Tis grace that has grown me safe thus far. And the same grace will lead me home. Kick a lock. Don't it? It's grace, grace. More grace and more grace. Paul has a few problems with grace. He has been chapter 1, first Corinthians 1, for he says, I thank God always, all of you have for the grace of God given to you in Jesus. There are issues. But thank God for the grace of God in them. I think my lack of earth is never like the grace of God. Some old song I used to have in my room with compass. I don't remember I had a line where it says, You know nothing if you don't know the grace of God. You know nothing. Christianity is not as complex as people like to make it be. Actually, Paul warned us about human philosophy. Come to the gospel. The love of God is grace. For those readers, like my words here, as for the third time to speak to us, all is done. He talks about what he has done. He say, I lay a foundation according to the grace of God which is given to me. And a wise master build a grace. A great foundation, but grace. And all of you guys are building on it. But I'm a wise master builder. Not because I'm so learned, not because I'm praying. But I'm a wise master builder. And this is not my effort, is the grace of God upon my life. Four or five years ago, with the Minister of Education and the Chamber of Nick, they were giving examination results like a 
I will not tell you, but one of them should pass say, we have walked for that. We burnt the midnight oil. We sealed all the doors. And we have delivered our credit results. We have this world. King Mr. President. Not that she has said, I'm scurrous. He has left her home. To make dream. If it was not for the grace of God, we would not have achieved this thing. One man gave praise to his dream. Another man recognized the grace of God in everything he did. May we as believers recognize that we might be one of the impeccable teachers. Powerful evangelists, but it is according to the grace of God in our lives. Or may give us a love of religion in grace, my brothers. We are at first grade as we finish 15. More really one line. It says, By the grace of God, I am. For I am. Can you see that we are? Speak like one go on for your state lab. So that is not good I made by his shoes. What do you think will happen if we carry this on? By the grace of God, I am what I am. This grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. I labored more abundantly than they all, but not I. But the grace of God, which was a child in my life. By the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, we have done what we have done. I'm sure when you're hearing this thing, some of us give things they did even imagine they would have given. Actually, you are shocked that you gave it. It's not you. The grace of God. A week later, I said, you must be a giver. He said, I don't even think I gave. I, I'm not sure whether I really gave. I've never done such a thing in my life. Second Corinthians 8, don't open, but they get it. Paul talks about giving. He says, brothers and sisters, I, I wish to bring to your attention the grace of God that was upon the church. Where? Macedonia. How they were broke? They were in debt. And they had had a crop failure and their neighbors had burnt their farms with fire. They didn't have food. They didn't have money. But when we went to Macedonia, they insisted they want to give towards the work of God. And we refused. We told them, brethren, you are starving. You have no shambas. Please, don't give. 
but they pleaded that we, they be given an opportunity to give and we refused. Then they told us that if you don't want to take our offering, take us. So they gave themselves to Paul. Said, so take us if you can't take our offering. Said, so when it came to that, we allowed them to give. And when they gave, they didn't give what they had. Nay, they gave more than they had. How do you understand that? They wanted to give so much that they went and took loans to come and give. They borrowed, because if you have a hundred bob and you give a thousand, where do you get the rest? You borrow. And Paul says, that's not normal. That was grace. And then he says, we are sending a brother to come among you so that he can develop the same grace in you. So there are graces. And they are developed. And grace can be allowed to grow. Dear brothers, First Corinthians sixteen twenty three. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Each one of you individually. Each one of us in our families and then corporately as a church. Now, there is something also when you talk to grace, it's about God's grace in giftings. So you also have the healing grace, giving grace. Now, someone in our church told me, that they have been in that church for 15 years and he does not remember members of the church being sick and being admitted more than five people for the last 15 years and yet we don't conduct healing so don't quote me I told him of the grace of healing. God gave it to me, I'm aware. So I don't have to pray for a sick person. But as I share God's word, whoever is sick just gets healed without prayer. I don't have to call them forward. Because that's the operation of the grace. We have a few women who are barren and I tell them just sit in church, I will not pray for you. Just sitting and listening and worshipping because of the grace that breaks barrenness. They don't need prayers. They don't need anointing with oil. That grace operates and they just get children. So there's a grace of healing and health. When grace is operating, it's not you. You don't have to sweat. It's grace. And you don't have to organize grace. It happens. And when Paul says, may the grace of God, I'm looking at your ministries, I'm looking at your families, place of work. Can you imagine the word grace also means favor. Genesis, the Bible says, and Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. NIV says, and Noah found favor in the grace, in the face of the Lord. And Moses says, God, if I found favor or grace, when God's grace is upon your life, God's favor is upon you. 
You guys are many. Our church in Kisi is about less than 100 people. About 50 adults. None of the members earn about 100,000. When the churches were shut down during the corona, God told me to start building. There are churches that began building 10, 15 years ago. By the grace of God, we are suspecting that by the end of the year, the building should be complete. Not because we are well organized. It is grace. Financial grace will release breakthroughs. The grace of giving. And Paul says that you know the grace of our Lord Jesus. Though he was poor, though he was rich, he became poor for your sake. You know the grace that was upon him. He gave all so that we may be rich in him. Brothers and sisters, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon you. Just raise your hands, please. As you close your eyes and raise your hand, just allow your heart to connect with Jesus. Your emotions, forget about everything. Just connect with Jesus. The Father of grace. You struggle, you've tried to do it yourself. But grace is when Jesus takes over. When Jesus just takes over. And he wants to. He says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He wants to carry you. Just let your heart connect with Jesus. Don't sing anything, brother. Just give me the music on the piano, please. You know, in this short time, burdens will be lifted. Sickness disappears. Burdens are lifted and chains are broken. As you raise your hands up. Jesus. Just connect your heart with Jesus as you raise your two hands. Just relax in his presence and in the grace of God. For some of you it will be dramatic. You will feel God's grace going through your system. For some of you will feel a relief as God breaks out legalism and you move from frustrations of 40 years under Moses and you come into the land and you come into rest and you come into your inheritance under Joshua by the grace of God. Jesus says, I want to do it for you. You're not strong enough. I'm strong for you. Jesus. You know I love you, Lord. Lord, I love you. More than anything. You're my friend. You're my redeemer. You're my king. You're my resource. You're my supply. Jesus, you're my everything. You're my inheritance. You're the door. You're the key. Jesus, you said to me that you open a door that no man 
will be able to shut. Thank you. Thank you for open doors. You know, Lord, I love you. I love you so much, Jesus. Your hands are raised up. If you have words, would you love him, please? Let him hear from your heart. I'm not asking you to pray. I'm asking you to connect with Jesus. When he takes over, diseases disappear, bondages disappear. You're the greater one in me. Greater is in me than the one that is in the world. Everyone just open your mouth and talk to Jesus. It's nearer than you think. It lives inside you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I love you. I love you so much, Lord. I love you. You're my Ebenezer. You're my beginning. You're my end. You're my Alpha. You are my Omega. Who shall I compare with Jesus? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Open your mouth and just raise your voice. And uh, he would like to hear your voice. And you know, the grace is sufficient. The grace is sufficient. The grace is sufficient. Thank you. For your grace has sustained me. I am what I am. I have what I have. I do the things I have done. Because of your grace. Jesus, your grace has taught me. Your grace has carried me. Everybody, don't listen to your neighbor. Just open your mouth. Everyone, just open your mouth. Everybody, just open your mouth and tell Jesus the things that are personal that you want to share with him. Just, I'm not asking you to pray for your neighbor. I'm not asking you to intercede. I'm just saying that just open your mouth and let your heart flow out. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Just worship him, the one in front of you, Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. I love you, Lord. I love you. You're more than silver. You're more than gold. You're more than any investment, Lord. You're my everything. Thank you. Thank you, God. You're my strength. You're my life. You're my life, Lord. Just raise your hand and close your eyes. Thank you, Lord, for healing. Thank you, Jesus, for those back problems that you are touching right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you. Thank you for the struggles that you are bringing to an end. It's not going to be by power, nor by might but by the help of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I've mentioned about the grace of fertility. If there be someone here, Lord, who is struggling with fertility, by your grace, your anointing, your hand upon me, we release that miracle in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the healing of sick bodies. Thank you for the blessing of job opportunities, promotions. Lord, there are people here who are saying they have served you. You've never surprised them. You're saying, Lord, surprise me. Thank you, Jesus. May you grant that desire of your child give them the surprise of their lives i give you glory i give you honor i give you praise thank you lord in jesus name we pray amen <laughs>